My name is Kyle Curtis. I am going to be your host this evening. And uh, we have curated a panel of some of the brightest minds and sharpest wits in Portland that are going to present to you on a variety of different topics. Uh, we have April Gallaty, Mark Salt Bites, Salt Bites, yeah. Mark Salt Bites, and Elizabeth Teets. And you, you are a local comic. I am, yeah. I've been doing it about two years, I guess now. Nice. And how has that been for you? Oh, it's been kind of fun. I mean, I've, uh, I've hosted some shows. I'm hosting a, uh, I host a mic on Friday nights out at, uh, um, uh, God, you made me have drinks. Uh, it's called the Hotbox 2.0. It's out in Chinatown at the Ming Lounge. There we go, got it. Okay. Uh, located in the back of the Republic Cafe. Back of the Republic Cafe, yeah. It's the smelliest mic in all of Portland. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, it is. It's really awesome. The sketchiest room on the craftiest crack corner. Come on down, ladies and gentlemen. What time? Uh, 9 p.m. on Friday nights. Uh, tell us a little bit more about this mic. Is it one of those uh, three minutes you're up and you're down? No, actually, it is one of those uh, fun mics where everybody gets a little more time. We do seven minutes. Uh, I, I co-host it with uh, Christopher Boatwright, and um, you know, sometimes, most of the time, I'm not there. He actually hosts it most of the time. So. And uh, was it encouraged to buy and sell drugs in this room? Uh, it happens. I'm gonna say that uh, crack deals happen quite often in the back behind while the mic's going on. But you, you are selling this mic. That's great. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> great. It's good. It's good. Um, I understand also that you uh, recently performed at a festival. I did. I was just at the North Carolina Comedy Festival um, in uh, Greensboro, and I'm actually heading back. Uh, next month for the uh, Cape Fear Comedy Festival, so which is in North Carolina as well. For some reason, they really like me in North Carolina. So. Maybe it's your voice. It might be. You never know. Might be your twang. Maybe. Yeah. Um, so, so local girl in Portland goes cross country to Comedy Fest in uh, North Carolina. Um, did anything come out of it for you? Did you? Meet some comics that really caught your eye. Well, what's your takeaway from the uh, North Carolina Festival? Uh, the takeaway that I take away from festivals is, is it might not be worth the money that you put into <laughs> them. <laughs> it's fun. I mean, I've had a good time, but traveling across the country to uh, perform for 10 minutes is not fun. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. I enjoy doing comedy, so like everybody else in this, in this game, it's just like, yeah, you'll put me on stage. Sure, I'll do it. Make some new friends. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. Right about exactly. Yeah. Um, are you on social media? I am. I am on social media. It is exactly my name. It's April Gallaty. Uh, Gallaty is G A L L A T Y. Yeah. Websites that, Facebook, Instagram, all of that. Good. And um, I understand you're going to be given a presentation about ferrets today? I am. I've, okay. had, I've had ferrets in my life for about the past 25 years, so tonight you get to learn about ferrets. Fantastic. Is this your first time giving this presentation? First time, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And if you need some uh, liquid courage, if the audience member wants to buy you a drink, what are you drinking? Uh, this is the passion fruit, uh, the pineapple passion fruit cider. So it's mm -hmm. delicious. All right. All right. Well, thank you, April Gallaty. Everybody get up for her. Now, uh, next on our panel presenters is Mark Sulfite. Yeah, like salt, yeah. salt fight, you know, sodium sulfite, something like that. Or uh, fight with salt? Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Throwing shakers if you can. Fantastic. Uh, Mark, where are you from? I'm from right here in Portland. I was born up at the end of Gleason when St. Vincent Hospital used to be there. Oh my goodness, you are a Portland native? Pretty much, yeah. That's, that's a rarity. Yeah, I know. Do you miss all your friends that you grew up with that left Portland? Or are they uh, still here? My friends haven't left, but that's because they were losers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Mark. I understand you're an author. I am. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I've written a couple books on football and one on palindromes, and then a computer book I wrote with my ex. Uh, I'm working on a, a book called The Mystical History of Palindromes. Uh, 2,500 years of satanic, sacred, and profane palindromes in cultures around the world. Tell me more about um, books. What what are those? <laughs> well, that, that is a book, actually. <laughs> yeah. I usually it's just these read clots that. of paper, and sort of like a toilet paper roll, except affixed at one end that you flip through. I usually it's like a just... flip book. Have you ever seen a flip book? It's like that with words on it. 
The only really make a picture is he. The only books I'm familiar with are coloring. Uh, yeah. I usually right. just read BuzzFeed top ten lists. I guess I'm a bookie then. Listicles, yeah. I understand, or what people read. Well, you know, it's interesting because when I when I, I wrote a book called The Dow of Chip Kelly about the Oregon football coach when he got went into the NFL. And at that time, everybody was like, oh, ebooks are going to take over everything, Kindle, you know, forget paper. And uh, so I signed up with a company called Diversion Books, which is a publisher that was like, we're going to do everything online. We'll print a few books in case Barnes & Noble wants them or whatever. But really, we're going all ebook. And that never really worked out. People like to hold a book. You like to go to the beach and not have your Kindle in the sand or whatever. Uh, and so I think ebooks maxed out about 30% of the book market and papers back. So, so are you don't saying, write it off too quick. Are you know? saying it plateaued and it's at 30%? Or yeah, it yeah, it plateaued and it's at 30%. Ironically, uh, the research I'm doing right now is like medieval and ancient books. So I'm, of course, looking at the stuff online, but it's a lot of photographs of like 9th century codexes from, you know, Charlemagne's court and that kind of thing with, with ancient palindromes and finding stuff like there's a guy named Sedulius Scotus. Uh, Scotus in those days just meant Irish, not Scottish, strangely enough. And uh, he was, can we cuss on the show? I believe we can. Yeah, wait, okay. So he was shit talking another monk that he got into a palindrome writing fight with. Wow. And so really a lot like a battle rapper today, except they're writing Latin palindromes. And uh, this guy thought he was hot shit because he spoke Hebrew as well as Greek and Latin. Sedulius only spoke Greek and Latin, which was still pretty good in that day. Uh, but he, he started with two pretty decent palindromes of Latin, and then the rest of it was just like, oh yeah, bring it on, bitch, you know? It's like, it's like, oh, the rhinoceros has torn the brow of the hornless beast. Don't bring up philology if you don't know how to do it, motherfucker. Oh, and like, this guy's a monk? <laughs> Isn't humility supposed to be part of the package with that and being saintly and whatever? But anyway. No, it's you, you can't get any. Yeah, it's true, it's true. That celibacy was a real problem for them back in the day. Uh, so it sounds like you're quite uh, quite knowledgeable about palindrome. I understand you'd be presenting about palindromes. I am, Sydney. yes, yes. Uh, and you have a title in regards to that. You want to share that? I, I, I was the first world palindrome champion. Ladies and gentlemen, of the day. You, of course. Are, you are in the presence of the world's first palindrome champion. How about that? <laughs> of course, two years ago, I got my ass kicked in the second one, and it came in seventh out of eight. But hey, what are you going to do? And were right. they like, bring they it on, They can't take away my first one. Yeah, and they brought it on. So okay. I, I talked a little too much smack myself. But here's the thing. Well, you know, it's a, it, it's a funny thing that you mentioned that because uh, we were talking earlier about authors, you know, that, that, that we like and they actually know each other and stuff. This will stun you. But of the world's top 12 polyndromists, we pretty much all know each other. And uh, and we're talking online all the time and get together and hang out. I think that's going to floor. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's literally... I don't know if you know, but nerds hang out with other nerds. <laughs> There's literally 12 people on earth who do this and like the guy who beat me is in Australia, right? And uh, the second place is a, uh, a bassooner, like I like to call him, from the Salt Lake City Orchestra, Lori White, the world's best female polyndromist. Uh, the third is a guy named John Agee who wrote a cartoon book called Go Hang a Salami, I'm a Lasagna Hog. Uh, we, he lives in San Francisco. So it's a pretty widely separated group of people who are not quite as nerdy as you might suspect. But, are you saying but not a lot less. Are, <laughs> are Palindromos actually cool? Well, <laughs> present company excluded, uh, All right. they're, they're better than you would think. Okay. Uh, Mark, if uh, somebody wants to buy you a drink from the crowd, what are you drinking, Steve? Stone IPA all day. My mom used to live in San Diego and I discovered this down there. I'm really excited to see it up here. Good stuff. Stone IPA. Yeah, if you they, like like really bitter, metallic, tongue-numbing IPAs, and I know you do, this is the one. They, they could not buy that kind of brand 
support that you just gave right then? They, they have to bribe me with beers. The, first, <laughs> yeah. the, first, the IPA preferred by Palindrome. Pal Palindromist. Palindromist. Pronounced Palindromist. Oh, okay. Get it right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mark. Salt beat. Salt bites. Salt, Salt bites. bites. Thank you. Uh, let's meet our third presenter of the evening, Elizabeth Teens, everybody. <laughs> I am from Oregon, just like general. <laughs> All over the state. Well, yeah, Te like technically, yeah. So, uh, born in Corvallis. Grew up in Vancouver, Washington, which is still part of Portland. That right, sure. shouldn't deserve greater to be its own city. Yeah, Greater Oregon. Sure. Uh, so we actually have two native Portlanders up here today. That is a that is extreme rarity. I found like yeah we have. Passive aggressiveness is strong. <laughs> <laughs> we have it's almost like double rainbow, you know, double Portlanders. Double notes to the roommate, like. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. So, um, so you uh, are, have been a comic for a while. How long have you been doing? A while. Just a while. Right? Just a while. <laughs> And in an indeterminate length of time. Exactly. That's cool. Same I, as my age. Uh, <laughs> do you uh, do you have or do, like April? Do you have a mic that you host or any shows? Or I shows? host a show at the Hollywood Theater um, called "Isn't She Great," which is a program that celebrates women in comedy. So we show a film with a female lead, and then we have a, a lady comic from across the country open it for us. Fantastic. Uh, when when is the show? What, is it a certain weekend? It, 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 it's not, it's pretty irregular. You can uh, check it out at hollywoodtheater.org slash isn't she great, and you'll see our next films and what's coming up and who's gonna be there. Do you have a, a next one planned or? The next one is May 31st. It's The Devil Wears Prada. Uh, and it's gonna have Becky Bronstein, myself, and Lamisa Brown from Seattle. Sweet, that's great. Um, so we were talking a little bit uh, earlier about the Bechtel test. Uh, for those who may not know what that is, you want to explain that a little bit? Sure. It's just um, it is a way to talk about uh, women in film, and the criteria of it is it has to have at least two women characters. They both they have to both have names, and they have to be talking about something other than a man. Okay. All right. So that's that's the criteria to pass the Bechdel test. Which is it is hard to pass the Bechdel test because like the Little Mermaid does not pass the Bechdel test. To be uh, fair, she does not talk for most of the movie. Right? Doesn't she lose her voice? Rude. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That movie has a strong female lead though, Ursula. It's true. Strong feminist female lead. That's true. That's true. Um, what is your favorite movie that passes the Bechdel test? First Wives Club. Okay, all right, fantastic. That's a strong choice. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then you also have a radio show, a I podcast. Do. Uh, it, it's a radio show. The podcast is a dirty word. <laughs> it's called Queens of Hollywood. I uh, host it with Anthony Hudson, who you may know in town as Carla Rossi, Portland's premier drag around. Uh, and we talk about cult movies, John Waters. Um, I also co-host my series with Anthony usually, so we also talk about what's coming up in our series. And generally, we pick a theme um, and then just talk about all the movies that we love that qualify under that theme. Maybe it musicals, um, action films, movies, movies about film. We just pick a really broad theme and then just kind of dissect it for an hour. Nice, nice, nice. Do you find how many Bruce Willis films pass the Bechtel test? We don't talk about Bruce Willis, because <laughs> like Bruce Willis is not a strong lady icon. Like way more Bette Midler shows up on the radio show and like share than Bruce Willis. Okay, cool. I feel like if Anthony and I were talking about movies, we'd be like, who's the bald guy? <laughs> like, you know that bald guy that's in that Christmas movie? Uh, that <laughs> Thank you for pointing out that it's a Christmas movie, because Die Hard definitely is. Um, where, if folks wanted to find you on social media, where should, where should they look? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, at Elizabeth Teets, but you should really follow me on Instagram, at E.L. Teets, because that's where the outfits are, which is why I know you're going to show up. E.L. Teets. Yes. E-E or E-A? E-L-T-E-E-T-S. Cool. Um, and if somebody wanted to buy you a drink, what are you drinking this evening? Um, I already had one, but I will accept mozzarella sticks. <laughs> All right, cool. Now, what I'd like to do is, uh, beginning with you, Elizabeth, uh, and going back to April, 
Um, the purpose of Drunk Discourse is uh, to conquer the fear of public speaking. I'd like to have you um, just share a little bit about your first time speaking in front of a crowd, um, any, any suggestions that were given to you that you found helpful, uh, maybe share that first story, um, and then, yeah, if you, if you, I'll, I'll let you take it from there. Sure. Um, I got into stand-up literally because I could not talk in front of people, but at the same time, for years, had been practicing stand-up in my mom's living room on her fireplace that was like, I had like that step that felt like a stage. So I would like get up there and I like kept falling off it. I was in about five Nazarene Christmas pageants because I went to my dad's house every other weekend until they eventually like stopped asked me to stop being in them because I kept ruining them. I fell out the bleach bleachers, just like started crying in the middle of my solo once. And then I was like, you know what's gonna help this? Stand up comedy. <laughs> and for about two years, uh, older comics, uh, people who are now on television would come up to me and like teach me how to hold the microphone. That's how long it took. But eventually you'll figure it out. Um, I recommend drag queens. <laughs> uh, drag queens just to watch them or to? Uh, just to like, you know, they give much better pet talks than other comedians. <laughs> interesting, interesting. My, my actually, you know, other comedians I had a hard time listening to, but. I haven't thought about that. I may, I may hunt out, need to hunt down uh, Carlo Rossi. Again. Carlo Rossi's mine, but like, <laughs> you can find your own drag queen to give you a pet talk. like. Full slate with Carla. <laughs> She's real busy. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah. Uh, Mark, let's uh, hear your experience. Con on that last note, I just want to say if anybody has not seen Darcel, Darcel is a legend, and you should go. It's super fun. Bring the biggest crowd. Darcel's what 86 now or something, and does eight shows a week. Any performer, any comedian, that is unbelievable, and it's it's pretty much stand up comedy with a little dancing. Definitely. So don't miss it if you haven't seen it. Definitely an institution in Portland. I find it odd that we have streets named, uh, like Cesar Chavez yeah. and um, Harvey Milk. Right. Eventually, I think that strip of Broadway is going to be named after Darcel. You can't name a street in the city of Portland after someone who hasn't been deceased for two years. So we do not want a Darcel street. Uh, yes. Not for some time, for sure. For At sure. some point. Uh, so Mark, yeah, share your story about conquering a, a fear of public speaking. Well, I was a high school debater, but you're saying in front of people. Um, so one judge I don't think really counts. I actually was a computer trainer in San Francisco, just temping after I moved down there. Uh, and it was very much like doing open mics because I was talking in front of 15 bored people who didn't want to be there. And if you're doing an eight hour Excel class, by three in the afternoon, you better be funny or they have totally checked out and, uh, and they're gone. And so I started cracking jokes and getting a little lippy and like mocking Microsoft in a Microsoft training class and, and people responded. And uh, so uh, back in 99, I think it was 98, 99, a uh, comedian named Eddie Izzard did a show in San Francisco, which was a big deal at the time. Robin Williams was promoting it. All my friends dragged me along. I'm like, whatever. I didn't really like stand-up, honestly. And it was unbelievable. I like was wiping tears off the inside of my glasses. It was so funny. And started going. And, uh, you know, I was right next to Cobbs, which is an amazing comedy club. And after about a month, I'm like, I'm funnier than that guy. <laughs> I'm funnier than that guy too. Oh, oh, other stuff. Not the comedians. The comedians. Not random people on the street. I'm maybe I don't know. There's no way to judge. Uh, but so started going to open mics, and uh, there you have it. It's been that way ever since, huh? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Do you have any advice for folks who want to come up and not necessarily? I do do. actually. Uh, well, first of all, I like this idea because you can put a lot of effort into the slides before you get on stage, and if you're shy, it takes focus away from you. And you know, so you're not going to be as self-conscious. But uh, as far as stand-up, I would say tell your funny stories. 
don't try to write jokes. It took me two years to figure this out of comedy. But everybody has a funny story. You know, you go to a party and there's a bunch of people there, and you've got the story you know people will laugh at, you know when to pause, you know when to look around the room dramatically. That's a stand-up comedy bit. And almost everybody I know has one, but they're, they're trying to do like, three Jews and a priest walk into a bar, right? No, 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 don't do that. Tell your funny story on stage and then build from there. Cool, all right, well thanks so much, Mark, appreciate sure. it. April, let's, uh, let's hear how you conquered the fear of public speaking. Well, it's, uh, I am from the South, so public speaking is something we do probably from the moment we start, <laughs> start talking, because we're supposed to be, uh, you know, our grandparents tell stories, our parents tell stories, and eventually you're like, okay, I want to be part of this group too, so then you jump in and you're like, pay attention to me. And then as soon as, the internet came about like I own Gallaty.com because uh, like the moment the internet was it existed I looked at my husband and was like can we get that and he's like yeah I remember going to our 10 year high school reunion and I was like I've got my own website and everybody's like yeah we know <laughs> and I'm like okay well you know I'm just I was just ahead of my time everybody else was just like oh I don't want anybody to pay attention to me and I'm like no pay attention to me so I really don't know what the, I mean, I've been nervous on stage and I shake like a leaf, but I want the attention so badly that I'm willing to push through it. Um, it for me, personally, it's just one of those things that's like, yeah, no, I want you to pay attention to me, so I'm going to push through it. Um, I just I just tell people, like, if you want it bad enough, get out there and do it. That's all, that's all there is to it, really. Do you remember the first time you did a, a open mic uh, stand up? Um, I do. Uh, it, actually, I did my very first open mic here um, at Kelly's on, on the 4 p.m. mic on Sundays. Wow. Yeah, so this is the very first place I did an open mic. So, yeah, I advise it. It's, it's a lot. This is a good mic, too. I advise it. It's just, I don't know. It's worth getting out there and just throwing yourself out there for people. So. Doesn't cost any money? Mm, not at all. No. Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks for thanks so much, uh, all of you, for sharing that story. Um, April, you said you did your first open mic here on the stage at Kelly's Olympia. You're also going to be given the first presentation uh, for the Drunk uh, Discourse uh, presentations this evening. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this is also the first time I've ever given a PowerPoint uh, drunk. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is hey. Good, yes. yeah. hey, everybody. My name is April Gallaty. I'm your ferret specialist today. Now, just so you know, right off the top, I have had ferrets on and off for about the past 15 years. I've had over 25 ferrets, so I have lots of knowledge, and I've been involved with them for a long time, so you can trust me on all this information, I promise. All right, ferrets, passengers or pilots of history. Now, according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, these creatures are as dangerous as piranhas and bath salts. Why? Have you ever wondered why? Um, have you ever wondered why something so cute and so adorable is more illegal in the United States than weed is? Makes no sense, but today you're going to find out. All right. Now, uh, the genus for the ferret is Mustella, okay? And the, um, let's see, this is really difficult. <laughs> uh, the family is uh, the Mustella die. Now, the thing about that is, is they do have a lot of cousins. They have river otters, they have regular otters, sea otters, um, you have martens, you have badgers, you have all the weasels. There's all various types of weasels. Okay, and then when you talk about their race, they are a ferret race, um, and these are racing ferrets. All right, and then, of course, their class is thief, but they're not very classy. <laughs> and their alignment is chaotic neutral. I don't know how, is it, will it, there it goes. Their alignment is chaotic neutral. Emphasis on the chaotic, yeah. Let's see if this will go. Okay, there we go. Now, rumor has it that if you step on a fresh ferret turd, in bare feet on a full moon, it will turn you into a dire ferret. Um, I've tried many times, it doesn't seem to work, but this is the rumor. <laughs> I've cleaned more turds out from between my toes than I even really want to talk about. All right, 
Ferrets can be found all over the world. You can find them in Scotland. And in Scotland, they call them the long cat. In uh, Spain, they call them el huron. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, in Norway, they're called hective. And then, of course, you know, people all over the world like to give their ferrets strange names. Um, they call them pillow piranhas. They, ca <laughs> they call them carpet sharks, you know. Um, of course, ferrets have protested this kind of like cutesy name for a long time. They don't really like it. Um, one ferret has stood out over the years as one to really protest this, and his name is Gary. <laughs> Poor Gary, he doesn't like it. All right, ferrets in history. Ferrets have, have shown up throughout history, and this is why I'm here to talk to you today. Ferrets uh, have shown up in hieroglyphs. Um, to the Egyptians, uh, the ferret was called Wiskatep. Now, the ferret Wiskatep was created when the sun god Ra was hungry, and he was also lonely at the same time, and he was like, I need somebody to play with, but I'm also hungry. And at the same time, he created Wiskatep, the ferret. Now, the Aztecs, the Aztecs believed that Rascalotl was the god of mischief. Now, Rascalotl is the god of mischief whom you pray to that if you have dealt it, yet you do not wish to be identified as the one who has. I'm sorry, if you smelt it, but you don't wish to be identified as the one who dealt it. God damn it! Messed up my own joke. <laughs> now, as you can see from the Nazca lines, Ferrets were once a prominent part of history, um, but they've almost just completely disappeared. They've almost been rele relegated to nothing but a smell joke. Now look, I'm going to tell you, ferrets do have a smell, but they don't smell. Does that make sense? So basically, ask yourself this if you really want to know. Why is it the same people who think that ferrets have a smell are also willing to lick a butthole? doesn't make sense to me either. I don't. It's mystery. All right. In this depiction of the pyramids, you can see that ferrets were involved in the, um, in the creation because it turns out that pyramids are perfect for play areas as well as having corners for backing into to poop. Now, Moses, on the other hand, learned the hard way. He reached for a weasel. Um, he was hoping it would turn into a staff. Turns out he learned the hard way. Don't poke things in front of in a ferret's face. It will bite it. Now, of course, weasels do this thing called the weasel war dance. And at the time, the Caesar was um, talking to the Romans, and the weasel went into a war dance, and everybody was like, oh, we're supposed to kill Caesar? And then they all stabbed Caesar. <laughs> it's an unfortunate, it was an unfortunate mistake. Yeah. All right, the great fires of Rome. After close inspection of this art, one can hardly blame Nero, you know, for uh, playing the fiddle. After all, he had a ferret to entertain. Ferrets get bored very easily. And certainly the ferret wasn't the cause of the jar of oil tipping over and, like, burning most of Rome to the ground. That would never happen, right? No. <sighs> All right, here's my favorite, 1490. Leonardo da Vinci actually painted this painting. He painted this painting four times. First, he painted Lady with No Ermine, and really, who wants that, right? <laughs> Look at that weird, shitty hand. <laughs> and then, then he created the second one, a lady with Nana's terrifying felted animal gift. I don't know what that is. Again, the hand's kind of fucked up. And then Lady with Ermine, perfect, right? But it turns out Da Vinci was better than you thought. He actually painted a fourth one. <laughs> there it is. Okay. If, <laughs> upon deeper inspection, it was discovered that Da Vinci actually in, had painted the skeletal system of the, of the Ermine. Now, 1605, the gunpowder plot. Now, this was started by Guy Fawkes and his renegade gang of Catholic ferrets. They were going to blow up the House of Lords to protest bathing ferrets too much. But the plot was foiled when the ferrets became excited at the sight of the fuses and drug them away to their hidey holes. All right, here we see Washington crossing a river. And he has his ferret Delaware on his back. It was, for a, it was a well-kept secret that, that uh, Washington was actually afraid of water and was afraid he was going to drown. 
but Delaware's curiosity urged him on, and the ferret's bravery led to the river being named after him. See, it's a close-up picture. It's a photograph at the time. The sinking of the Titanic. Many historians have wondered how the captain of the ship could have possibly missed seeing the huge iceberg in the water, but it's clear that the ferrets on board were distracting him with their antics. You can't exactly look away from the cuteness when it's right there in front of you. Oh, I'm sorry. Ha! <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Assassination of President Clinton. God damn it. I almost said assassination of President Clinton. How about that? Assassination of President Lincoln. His security team was napping at the time of the assassination, and most people don't realize that ferrets sleep 16 to 18 hours a day. So it turned out making them security was a really bad idea. Okay, here we go, the Titanic. <laughs> Okay, and then, uh, of course, here you see through the power of enhance, uh, you can see one of the ferrets looking out the porthole at the exact moment the photo was taken. All right, here's my favorite. Bonnie and Clyde and their crime, and ferret and crime bandit. Bandit was, a good, it was good at snatching small valuables for him, not knowing that of Lincoln's problems, of course. They made the, uh, the mistake of making bandit their lookout, and this ill-fated decision cost all three of them their lives. I know, it's sad. They didn't do all good things. Like Amelia Earhart, she took her trusted ferret and co-pilot, and, 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 and this was devastating to women, ferret lovers, and aviation lovers everywhere. Ferrets are known for their sense of adventure, but they are not known for their sense of direction. <laughs> Here we have the assassination of Kennedy. Now, ferrets are, uh, this ferret in this photograph, if you can see, he has the bottle brush tail, which is a sure sign of excitement or scared. We don't really know how this ferret voted, so I don't know if he's happy or sad about this going on. And of course, in 1970, everybody believed that the Beatles were broken up by Yoko Ono. Turns out that his live stole actually required more attention than Yoko Ono. <laughs> That's who broke up the... The Beatles, I'm sorry to let y'all know. Now, Tupac Shakur. Tupac Shakur wrote, wore live mink. This is little dank stank. <laughs> oh, and Snoop, Snoop Dogg. Don't forget Snoop Dogg back there in the back. And then, of course, his rival. You got Biggie Smalls with his ferret, Smalley Biggs. And then finally, I'm going to bring this all together for you. So if you look at the dollar bill, the United States dollar bill, why am I telling you all this? Well, this is what it all culminates to. Basically, if you look at the United States dollar bill, you can see hidden amongst all the little imagery that there is a ferret in the bottom right-hand corner of, of Washington's nostril. You can see, there's a 1,000 times... Uh, uh, yeah, whatever, I forgot the word. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, so here's the punchline. ba dum ba ba dum ba Illuminati. <laughs> Thank you. That was silly and put together really quickly. Thank you, everybody. Today I want to share some exciting discoveries in the field of palindromics. As you've heard, I was the world's first palindrome, the first world's palindrome champion. After that, I went into the private sector and worked to commercialize this important technology. And I want to share some discoveries we've made with a startup company we're doing that uh, may provide an important uh, investment opportunity for some of you if you're far-sighted and uh, forward-thinking enough. Uh, this is a technology that can bring joy to you and your family, as well as provide help to the American economy and defense establishment, as we're going to establish here. What is a palindrome, you ask? It's a sentence or phrase that is the same backwards and forwards as you see here, an igloo, cool, Gina. <laughs> Uh, a little bit about my background. If you're thinking about investing in our company, you're going to want to know, who are you, Mark? Where have you been trained or gained this expertise? That is a totally fair question. I studied at Harvard, not the famous one in Boston, but Harvard State, which is located in <laughs> eastern Massachusetts. It's the world's first land-grant university. Uh, and uh, there I did some early research in the Zimbabwean binary antelope, which as you can see is the world's first and best known palindromic animal. 
Uh, I went then to study under the great Professor John Conant at the University of Minnesota, uh, who, uh, as you see, uh, grabbed a, a team of research assistants uh, who were naturally suited to palindromes. And he made the exciting discovery that a palindrome, uh, that the word of any word, not only palindromes, is actually a unit of energy, smaller than a quark, but with uh, uh, power equal uh, to 17,000 times that of a proton. You can see the relative size of each of these items. And he came up with some extremely powerful sentences uh, that were, of course, all palindromes. For example, I am proud to say I was on the team that developed the first one here, asking the important question, Eva, can I stack Rod's sad-ass dork cats in a cave? <laughs> Surprisingly, the answer is yes. Uh, so we have taken this technology and we're trying to commercialize it into a viable private company, combining the power of palindromics, science, and genetics into a company that we call Cynogenics. <laughs> Founded in 2015, we now have 272 employees in four states and we're looking to go public on September 10th of this year. Before we go into that, I want to give a little background on the history of palindromes and their power throughout history. The first palindrome known to man is the word spoken to Moses, quote unquote, from God in the burning bush, which is ahye, asher, ahye, a word unit palindrome in Hebrew. We translate it as I am who I am, uh, but you can hear the power right there. And that doesn't quite translate into English, so uh, by doing some more research, I found perhaps a, a more fitting translation into our language, which is dogma, I am God. Thank you. Or more controversially, dog sex, even if fine, vexes God. This is Portland after all. Uh, from then, we went into, uh, the, uh, in Egypt, the Greek magical papyri, where people he wielded the power of palindromes for evil curses and healing spells, such as the famous Abla Thanalba, which was later transformed into the word we know, abracadabra, and then ruined by Steve Miller in a shitty song. Uh, yeah, so I've already said that stuff, okay. Uh, Stone IPA, in case anybody forgot what I'm drinking here. Thank you. Uh, in, the, in the Middle Ages, during the time of Charlemagne, monks and other holy men tried to use this to explore the power of God, such as Bishop Rabanus Morris uh, in 800 AD. He did these amazing grids of letters, and then he would draw shapes, and the letters that fell inside the shapes would spell out different words. This is him worshiping the palindrome that he wrote here. And if you zoom in, you can see that it says, go hang a salami, I'm a lasagna hog. <laughs> However, even though people were trying to wield this for the glory of God, it became entangled with darker forces and satanic spells. This is St. Martin of Tours, who is sort of an army saint, if you can imagine, a, a warrior who attacked pagan temples and actually used palindromes to command Satan himself to ferry him to Rome like an early airline or jetpack or something, using these palindromes, signa te signa, tamere me tangus et angus, Roma tibi subitu motibus ibit amor. Today, however, in this secular time, the only people who still understand the power of palindromes are heavy metal bands, such as Black Sabbath on their classic live EP, Live Evil, or Soundgarden and their EP, Satan Oscillate My Metallic Sonatas. Okay, let's go to the science behind palindromes. Why does this work, Mark? Why should we invest money in your company? Excellent question. This is a way to amplify the awesome energy of words. I don't know what happened there. Okay. And look at a standard sentence, I like to run in apples. Palindromes, just to start off, you can see how you double the power of those words by going backwards, right? 
as in this example, Snub Dumbo Bob, Mud Buns. If we actually have done the scientific measurements of the power of these words, the standard sentence I like to run in apples, 1.4 million electron volts, Snub Dumbo Bob's surprisingly is way more than double that amount. It's not 2.8 million electron volts, it's 19.7. What is going on? Well, it turns out this uses the force of the gravitational slingshot, which you may remember was used to propel a satellite towards Jupiter. If you come close enough to a power, the force can propel you out into space. In this case, because you go around the sentence, which is a highly massive object at the end of a sentence, it amplifies the force and sends you back at this much higher uh, uh, rate of acceleration. Furthermore, the waves of energy align and amplify each other, as you can see in this diagram, further magnifying. If you know the uh, resonance, if you've had like a resonant frequency, if you're an engineer, it can really shake and disrupt things. The palindromic resonance, because it aligns, becomes extremely powerful. Uh, we don't have time to go into all these numbers here, but we can talk about it later. You may remember the most famous example of this, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. You probably saw this video in grade school. What happened was they built a bridge up near Tacoma across a narrow path, and when the wind blew, nobody realized that it made the sound ooh, which is a palindrome. So what happened was, see if we get this there, the wind started blowing, and that is an actual concrete and metal bridge that started wielding and then completely blew up. So of course, I looked at that and said, awesome, blow shit up, let's make some money off of this. So here are some applications. Our early research was not military and defense oriented. We went into music criticism with, oh, Nikki Six is icky, no. And you'll notice they broke up immediately afterwards, Motley Crue. Uh, blasphemy, Yahweh Chu Hei. American church attendance is down to its lowest level in history. And then finally, you may remember when meth was a scourge in the early 2000s. We got a contract with the, the Department of Drug Eradication and developed this palindrome, deep snuff. Oh, Margaret, fast? Ah, uh, no. Sexy? No. Di put stupid onyxes on hats after a gram of fun speed. <laughs> and as you all know, meth use dropped precipitously everywhere in America except Troutdale. <laughs> so after these early successes, we got a contract with the Department of Research Projects Administration, sure, uh, and uh, got some money from the federal government to develop weapon reuses of this technology. Here's some early tactical palindromes. Drat, suck custard. Sit on a potato pan, Otis. And Dr. Annie's pale Pacific ape laps in nard. Since then, we got some initial uh, venture capital and we've been developing a new generation of potent strategic palindromes. Drat's a bad nag and a bastard. On I blab, mud dumb I albino. And Dennis, Kaya, and Edna, a yak, sinned. Our biggest demonstration of concept took place early in the Obama administration, focused on Osama bin Laden. Now, the cover story is that a SEAL team went out and raided him. But what really happened is we developed a palindrome of weaponry based on Islamic uh, scripture and targeted him with... Uh, we, we tried several. We went Guru Man Osama's on emu rug, not that powerful. Ed under a deli, Osama soiled a red nude. <laughs> Starting to get there. Uh, and then we came up with this one. Eid Osama, so die. We got authorization to outfit an F-26 stealth fighter jet and attacked Osama's compound. This has been hushed up. You guys haven't been able to see this shot before, and you can see them strafing the compound with the result that we all know about. So, the power of polyndromy wielded towards weapons, as well as political advertising and drug education. This is the future of our company. This is what we are asking you to give us money to fund for our IPO that's coming out in September. 
and we hope you will consider this as a way to make gobs of money. Thank you very much. Please welcome to my presentation, Crazy Exy Cool. Why Crazy Ex-Girlfriends Rule the World. When I was a teenager, I went to a movie called John Tucker Must Die. And upon watching the movie, I learned John Tucker does not die. He just like learns something about like the power of human connection and like why you should treat women as people. That is not the movie I paid $9 for. I paid to watch John Tucker die. And then I started thinking about all of my favorite songs. I like Goodbye Earl by the Dixie Chicks. I like The Thunder Rolls by Garth Brooks. I, I like that song by Carrie Underwood, you know the one. Thank you. And that's when I realized I like country music. <laughs> because it's the only genre of music where you are allowed to kill a white man. <laughs> Can't do it in any other. My favorite crazy ex-girlfriend is Elle Woods. She's the best one. She's the best one because not only did she go so psycho, she took the LSATs. Like, you could not pay me to take the LSATs. Oh, good, good, she said she was doing it for love. No, she was doing it for revenge. Warner didn't even get into Harvard on his own accord, but Elle Woods did. How would you like it if you were just, like, sitting at Harvard and you're like, yes, I am the world's elite now, and the girl you called dumb showed up? We all know these ladies. They're fucking in charge. <laughs> foreshadowing, foreshadowing to how apeshit Beyonce was gonna get in like a few years. How, like, let's just take a moment, Jay-Z, he was like, yeah, I'm gonna revolutionize the music industry. I'm gonna create this thing called Tidal where, where you know, artists get paid fairly and I'm gonna become even more of a mobile. And then the only thing that kept Title afloat was that he cheated on his wife and she wrote an album about it so baller, everyone needed to get a subscription. <laughs> For, everybody talks about Beyonce and Jay-Z as this power couple and they are the wealthiest couple in America. It is all Beyonce's money. <laughs> Like, almost all Beyonce's money. This is great foreshadowing because we got to see Beyonce and Lady Gaga, like, murder a bunch of people in a diner. Like, wouldn't it be nice if you could, like, seek revenge on assholes and then there's just, like, toast? Love toast. <laughs> toast is an underrated breakfast food. Like, you're always like, what kind of toast do you want? And you tell them and then you don't really think about it when you order the entree, but if your omelet and hash brown showed up without toast, how mad would you be? Mad enough to poison everyone in the diner. <laughs> this is a real life crazy ex-girlfriend who is deeply underrated. And her biggest crime that she ever did was tried to trademark the name Kardashian for herself. She was engaged to marry into that family. And they were so mad that they were like, no. I want to take a moment to appreciate Black China because like the Kardashian have appropriated black culture since the beginning of like their careers. Thank you. And she just like, I know. And she just like showed up and was like, hey. <laughs> also, revenge porn, which was just what Rob Kardashian did to her. She sued him and won. You don't mess with Black China. She's the best crazy ex-girlfriend because she'll take you to the court of law. And she will win. She wins every time. Like, and like, she's the only Kardashian who like didn't name their baby something super dumb. Like, Dream Kardashian is like the best Kardashian baby name. <laughs> Let's talk about how Glenn Close was totally robbed of an Oscar this year. I like lost my shit. 
when they gave it to that other lady. I thought they were going to give an Oscar to Lady Gaga for Boast Actress, and I was like, if you give an Oscar to Lady Gaga and you do not give one to Glenn Close, there will be Fatal Attraction 3. <laughs> I am going to be the star of it. Glenn Cl who's who's seen this movie? Uh, this These slides are based off a Tumblr I have. It's called crazyexwhocool.tumblr.com where I just talk about crazy ex-girlfriends in media and how they like win life. And I had not seen this movie when I started this Tumblr. And it is the best one because it has every crazy ex-girlfriend trope where like a guy gets with a woman and then she's like, hey, and he's like, you're trying to ruin my life. That's the whole plot of the movie. <laughs> like she just shows up where she's supposed to and talks like a normal human person. And his whole, like, seriously, he's just like, ah, get away from me. And she's like, would you like to treat me with, like, a, this much of human decency? And he's like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> There's a trope that shows up in, uh, like, the, in Crazy Ex-Girlfriend Dumb a lot. And it is a woman who, like, refuses to get an abortion. And that is, like, ruining a man's life. And that's the only reason she's refusing to have the boyfriend is just to like hurt him. It's like the flip side of like her body, her choice. It's only like her body, her choice, unless you, I have to take any type of responsibility, <laughs> then I don't want to be a part of this. It's frustrating. Uh, my favorite part of this movie is that they made it, the, like the big scary thing is that she kept calling on a landline. Like, that was the most horrifying thing that ever happened is she was calling on the landline and, like, the wife might answer. And she dies because she... She dies at the end of this movie because she shows up and expects him to take financial responsibility for a child that is his. That's the whole, that's the whole plot of the movie is she's like, I'm pregnant, maybe you should do something about it. And he's like, you're trying to ruin my life and keep calling me on a landline <laughs> that I could very easily disconnect. Love it. This is Hayden from American Horror Story. Somebody else that refused to have an abortion to ruin a man's life. It's the only reason anybody has a baby, by the way. It's like, how, how can I hurt a man? Hayden is the hero of American Horror Story season one. Because, like, thank you. See, this is the thing. There are, like, ghosts and the rubber man, and crazy murderers. She's the scariest thing in that season. She's so scary, because she's like, gonna show up and make you responsible for your actions. <laughs> you might have to take accountability. <laughs> this is like the most horrifying thing to a straight man of like, you did something you shouldn't have, and now you're going to face the consequences. <laughs> ah, but I was used to getting away with everything. <laughs> what do I do? Why are you trying to ruin my life by stating facts? <laughs> Probably none of you know who this is, but this is Blue Cant Cantrell, who brought us the hit, hit up style, and taught us the most important lesson of Hey, ladies, if your man want to get buck wild, just go back and hit him up style. Get his, your hands on his cash and spend it to the last dime for all the hard times. <laughs> this song, this song beat Elvis Presley's record. This is, not, this is not a joke. This is true. Beat Elvis Presley's record for the most played single of all time. And we never heard from her again. We never heard from her again. This song also is kind of interesting in the history of music, and this is also true, because they found that if a song contains the word hit in it, it will probably make it to number one on the Billboard charts. So like hit em up style was on purpose. We just, learned, we just watched a whole presentation about the power of words. Like this one freaking did it. Um, this song I think is really important because, you know, she's crazy, so all the only thing she does, like she never interacts with the man who did her wrong, 
She just like buys a lot of shoes. To me, that sounds like healing and self-care. <laughs> and if like you listen to the song, it's clear that they like aren't married but have probably been together for a while. Like really, this is just alimony for a common law marriage. Good for her. This song was like pandering to your mom. They like really wanted her to like it. Um, whose mom like loves Carrie Underwood now? Okay, just mine. That's fine. My mom's pretty much like that mom. Um, this song taught you, you, you know, if your man doesn't have a dog, like maybe he has a car he really likes, and you should treat that car the way he treated you and just destroy it. Like, this isn't a song about revenge. This is just keeping it equal. <laughs> and I didn't realize that Shania Karaoke was always white trash <laughs> until this song. I was like, oh, wow, that doesn't, don't impress me much is really sung by people who don't impress me much. <laughs> Interesting. Now this song. Who's seen this movie? Yes. This movie I grappled with because I was like, oh no, we might have a crazy ex-girlfriend who's like actually really bad. And the first time I watched it, I was like, no, this is bad. She's actually like really bad. But then I thought about it and I was like, this woman taught me the most important lesson I will ever learn in my entire life. And that is how to completely terrify a man into submission. Ben Affleck got back with her and is going to stay for the, he's not waiting till that baby turns 18. He's staying for the rest of his life with the woman who tried to put him on trial for her murder. I also like this movie because they murder Neil Patrick Harris. And we all know that he's like secretly a Republican. Like, let's be honest. Again, terrify a man is submission. This happens way more than, you know, how many like people know like a couple where the man could not feed himself if it was not for the woman? Yeah, yeah, like every woman is like, yes, I, like, I'm in that relationship right now. This movie just teaches you how to take that to a level 10. <laughs> Thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, some honorable mentions that I did not include in this presentation include um, The Other Woman with Cameron Diaz, where they all become friends, and also my favorite movie of all time, The First Wives Club. There's one thing about The First Wives Club that I find very disappointing, and that is in the trailer for The First Wives Club, you see Bette Midler and Sarah Jessica Parker at the beginning of where they're going to engage in a physical fight and they cut that out of the movie. At, in the trailer, Bette Midler picks up a pie server and holds it to Sarah Jessica Parker's throat, and it is a deleted scene. And I have tweeted at Bette Midler about this once a week, every week, <laughs> for many weeks. So if you could also tweet at Bette Midler about this deleted scene, I would really like a copy of it. Thank you. <laughs>